Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first Heritage Live. Uh, my name is Heather Poussard. I am the Operations Coordinator here at Coquitlam Heritage. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to let you know we're going to do a little bit of question and answer at the end. So at the bottom of your screen, if you're on Zoom, there's a little button that says Q&A where you can ask any questions that you have throughout the presentation. Um, if you're on the Facebook Live, you can just comment it there and I'm going to keep an eye on those. And then at the end, um, we'll have some uh, time for some questions and answers. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our heritage manager, Tanis Koskela, and she's gonna get us going. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Coquitlam Heritage's Journal Project Live. So this is my first live presentation. I'm AB assisted by Miggy Ferreira on techno support, and you just met Heather, who's been invaluable. And we're here to talk about our journal project. So before I talk about the journal project, um, I'd just like to mention that if you're interested in following us, our hashtag is history unfolding Q 2020 on social media. So that's hashtag history unfolding COQ 2020 on social media and history unfolding and COQ are capitalized or C is capitalized. So we, um, if you haven't seen our post, you can check our website about the web, the uh, journal project. And the reason we're doing that, this is because the year 2020, as everyone knows, is a unique moment in history as the globe responds to this pandemic that is going around. It's had an impact on everyone. So we have invited the Coquitlam community to take part in our journal project to help us document how our community has lived this experience. We want to hear your stories as they unfold and while they are still fresh in your mind. Since we can't meet people face to face, journals are an ideal format for this. So you might be wondering if you don't already have one, how do I start a journal? What do I put in it? The answer is whatever you like. Drawings, collages, thoughts and feelings, photographs, mementos, and uh, these are all things that can illuminate this place in history for future gen generations. A few famous people that have kept journals over the years include people like Charles Darwin, Mark Twain, Marie Curie, Lewis and Clark, Frida Kahlo, and Leonardo da Vinci. And the diary of Samuel Pepys from the 1600s has survived to tell us about, among other things, the Great Plague. These people's diaries give us insight into the author's frames of mind, the processes in creating their journals, the times they lived in, and they provide corroborating evidence and information about events and other people. So I have accumulated a few little examples of journals here. Journals are essentially primary, uh, primary resources, and historians use primary resources for a lot of things. They can use them, as I just told you about the other journals, to corroborate events in history. They can use them to connect the dots between this thing that happened and that thing that happened. They are records of people that were alive at the time. And you never know what kinds of little details you're going to find in these kinds of first or primary resources. So these primary resources that I've brought in are from various eras in history. I've tried to arrange them roughly from the farthest back to the most current. So this one is the Illustrated Chronicles of Matthew Paris from the, from the 13th century. And he kept a journal that was beautifully illustrated. There's a sample of his handwriting. He put in little images throughout. He also did pictures like this but he talked about daily life in that time and place and there are references to the plague in that and there's all kinds of details that that can elucidate another one is canadian exploration literature so this one is a selection of primary resources that was put into a book and it includes the reminiscences and the journal entries of famous explorers such as uh, George Vancouver, Alexander Mackenzie, the John Franklin expedition, Anthony Henday, all kinds of different places, people throughout the first few centuries of this country's settlement. One thing that I like in this journal, this journal selection, 
oh, my bookmark is missing. Someone in the journal here took the time to record local native languages. It's in this book. And without that, we might not have had a record of those early languages that some of them may have not even be spoken anymore. This is the letters and journals of Simon Fraser. Of course, the Fraser River is an important part of this area. And he kept a detailed journal and he recorded all of his adventures. Oh, this is the one that has the sample of the native languages. And he took the time to write down the words that people spoke as he went through the countryside. So these are important things that can be lost through his, in history. Another really interesting one is this one about Shananditi. She was the last of the Bay of Tux to survive. The tribe is now extinct. But because she took the time to make pictures and enter information, we have her handwriting, we have maps she drew, her interpretation of the territory she lived in. There are even things in here that show routes that she took or that her people took over the years. So that history has been preserved. This uh, is another map that she drew for the people that she stayed with before her demise. And I think we got a couple of other things in here too that are of interest. The, uh, this tells us something about the cultural heritage. These are some of the tools that they used, the Beotuk, and she preserved that information through her drawings and writing. Without that, we wouldn't have had a whole lot of information. So there's some more of her drawings. This is a famous author, and this is a collection of Marcel Proust's letters. These letters are full of all kinds of information that may not be, may not have been preserved otherwise. So it's a look at the inner workings of the mind of this author. I like this one. This is memories of old, of the old plantation home. So this is roughly Civil War area, era or pre, and it has a lot of information in it, such as somebody saved. One of the people that lived on the old plantation was Laura. And we have her report card from 1877 when she was 15. Not only does that tell us about Laura, but it also tells us about what kinds of things they looked at in the marking of students back then. Punctuality was the top of the list. There's natural philosophy. Penmanship was something that was marked. And there was also English written exercises, history, and rhetoric, which is not something you see on a 15-year-old's report card anymore. We also have Anil Lecoul's death notice, which was preserved by someone somewhere and then included in this book. It tells what he died of, it tells where, it tells dates. This one has a civil marriage registration for Charles Gore and Laura. And this is a... Um, the Laura Sugar Plantation is going to have an auction. So there's an auction notice. And something to note about an auction notice at this time is potentially it was a slave auction. That auction notice doesn't actually say that, but it's possible. Speaking of slaves, this book also has a record of slave names that lived on the plantation, which is something that you might not find anywhere else. So here's the list of this man that lived on this plantation, 17 slaves. These people might have disappeared from history, except this man took the time to record their names, which is invaluable if you were a descendant of the slaves and you wanted to do research into family history and you find those names. And what else have we got in here? We also have an example of a Confederate note. So there's all kinds of things that can go into journals that can tell us things about the past. Let me get rid of all my bookmarks so that you can see the other things I have here. This was lent to us by Jenny, who works here. This is Frida Kahlo's diary. And this is really beautiful because she included pictures. She has her writing. She used different color inks for different entries. 
there's plans for pictures that she plans to paint. There's sketches. It's just gorgeous and it's got all kinds of information in it. So there's another one. That's another type of journal. And of course, one of the most famous ones, the diary of Anne Frank. And if you don't know who Anne Frank is, she was a girl who was in hiding during the Holocaust and wrote a journal and it tells a lot about that time. This one is a little more recent. This is William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. They exchanged a bunch of letters. They're called the Yage letters in this book because most of them refer to their hunt to use the uh, hallucinogenic ayahuasca drug in South America. So they exchanged a lot of interesting letters about that time to each other. And it tells us a bit about them as well. Here's one that I never paid much attention to growing up. It was something that was written by a friend of our family's. It's called My Little Town. And it's about the town of Paris, Ontario, where I was born. It was written by Delphine Hopper. And at the time, I didn't give it any thought at all. But now that Delphine is gone, and I no longer live in the area, it's a really interesting compendium of information about the area, what she did during her life. I'm learning more about, I have learned more about Delphine from this book than I did actually knowing her. So that's another thing that you can do. You can write about your life. And here's my journal, my current journal. In my journal, I have written things. It was a gift from my husband, so he put a picture in of us. I have plans for different projects. I've pressed leaves. I have plans for art. I have a ticket from somewhere that I went that I wanted to remember. And I particularly like this. I was driving with my family in two cars from Edmonton to Jasper and we didn't have cell phones. So this is how we communicated. We passed my son driving in his car because we wanted to stop in Edson. So we didn't want him to get too far ahead and drive through Edson. So we made this note and I used my journal to communicate, but that is a record of that trip together. So those are some of the journals. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the primary resources that people might include in a journal. So one of the ones that I have here is, this is a certificate from the Provincial Exhibition Better Babies Contest that took place in 1921. This is for the baby James Noel Allard, and he has been examined for physical and mental development according to the Better Babies Standard Scorecard as issued by the Medical Board of Examiners, New Westminster, and he achieved a score of 97 and a half. What a baby. 97 and a half, you don't get much more perfect than that. But this fragile little item tells us names, it tells us dates, it tells us about an event, the provincial uh, exhibition. It's got the names of the signees that approved this baby for 97 and a half. It's got a seal. So it's got a lot of information. If this were to be found in someone's journal or scrapbook, it would provide quite a bit of information. The other thing I have here, it's not necessarily a primary resource, but it speaks to primary resources. It is a little box and it's got the poem on it to market to market to buy a fat pig then home again home again jiggity jig and then the second verse to market to market to buy a fat hog home again home again jiggity jog so this little box has in it a correspondence kit for children so not only do people very rarely write personal letters anymore but this is for children how many children do you know that write letters unless they have a pen pal or something However, letters are very great primary resources. You can use them for all kinds of things. They have dates if they're written with a date, of course. They have information, they have news, they refer to, to um, current events often. They are examples of writing styles, they have postmarks, they have addresses, they have all kinds of information on them that you might not think about. And of course, postcards fall into that category. So here's a postcard that was written on the 18th of October, 2000, or 1908. And it was addressed to someplace in Stockwell. And on the bottom it says local, local, and it's to Lydia. And it gives a little bit of news. 
it's postmark South Lampton, which is not too far from where I grew up. And it has a picture of Loch Lomond in Scotland. So that can also give us information. This one has, this one doesn't have any writing on it, but if it did, well, it does have some writing on it. It says, thanks for searching out the dress forms. We're going to corner the market and make our fortune. This doesn't have a date on it. It does have a kind of a funny cartoon on it that, refer, that makes you think of a certain era. It's a picture of a hobo sneaking into a hen house and it says, I'm stealing a few moments to wish you good health and all the nice things you'd wish for yourself. Hobos don't sneak into chicken houses too often these days. So there's another example of correspondence that is a good primary resource. The next thing I have to show you is this. Again, this is not necessarily a primary resource, but again, it refers, it makes you think of a primary resource, which might be a birthday party. So people may have attended a birthday party and often people receive birthday party invitations. They have party favors. They may have, and the invitations themselves might tell you who was at the party, when it was. So birthday parties, invitations, special events, that kind of thing are all good primary resources if you have the evidence for them. Newspaper clippings, of course, are one of the better primary resources. This one is quite faded, but it came from the Vancouver Sun in 1959. It talks about a jubilee pageant honors Millardville's history. And of course, we're in Millardville now. So there's that. But the other thing that I like about newspaper clippings is on the reverse side, there's all kinds of local businesses advertised. You might find interesting articles on the back that you were unintentionally collected, like this one talks about three meets organized in Surrey at the Legion Hall. So there's that. And this one is also about an article that was obviously cut out because it refers to Millardville. This one is not as useful. And the reason that it isn't is because whoever saved this clipping didn't retain the date on the top of the clipping. So we don't know exactly when this came from. And again, on the back, we can see styles from the year that this was there, this uh, advertisements, and there's lots of information that can be gleaned from that. People also save mementos. This is a religious card that was saved by someone. It's got a picture of the, of a, I believe it's Mary and Jesus. And there's writing on the back of this as well. And also a date from 1916 written in faint pen. So that's a nice little memento. That's some information there. Receipts. You might not think of saving receipts unless you're someone like maybe my father who saves receipts and they're very interesting when you do look back at them. This one tells prices. From this you can infer the machines that were used to print the receipt. You can look at the name of the business, where it existed, what was paid for the items. So for instance, on here, they bought some fabric, they got 15% off and it was three meters. It cost, looks like $28 for three meters of cloth. And I believe the date was 1989. So there is some information. And also it makes you wonder what was somebody making? Is it something that's around that we can look at today? This little package of needles is also a primary resource. It tells you that it was sold only, only by the T. Eaton Company, Toronto and Winnipeg. It was made, they were made by Abel Morale Limited in Redditch, England. They're called Lady Fair Needles. So there is an example of a, an object that is small enough to put in a scrapbook and gives you information. So there's another primary resource. My favorite primary resource that we have here today is this autograph book that I found in the collection. It's from the 40s, I believe, 45 mostly. And it's got lots of rhymes. Autograph books can give you a lot of information. They can give you information about friends. They can give you names. They can give you connections that people had to other people. And often they refer to specific events. This one is amusing to me because it's got evidence of a trend or a fad at the time in autograph book writing. 
And that is a lot of people added to their little inscriptions to the person that owned this things that say yours till the next time, not before. This one says yours till butterflies. This one says yours till I don't know or IDK it says. And this one says yours till the chicken coops. And this one says yours till Niagara Falls. And this one says yours till the stork stops kidding the world. And then yours till you fall to pieces, not before. And I like this one because, oh, and here's, an, here's another one, yours till the kitchen sinks. So that's kind of interesting. It was a fad at the time in the 1940s, and that's what you can find from this. I also like this because I talked to an elderly man in the community not too long ago, and then by chance I found that he had actually signed this autograph book. So at some point I plan to, to remind him of that and see if he remembers writing in the autograph book. But because that name is there, we can contact him and we could maybe find out potentially information about the other people in this book. And I also have mementos that people might have saved from special events. This is somebody's ID card from Expo 86. And here's another one on the back. It's got regulations. It's got signatures. It's got dates. So that's kind of interesting. Other events that people have saved things from were the PNE. This one is uh, cards that somebody that was presenting something at the PNE had, and she was invited to the cultural activities luncheon. But she also presented a diorama, non military, paintings and drawings, jewelry. Boy, she must have been really busy. Ceramics and handicrafts, metalwork. Oh, no, that was Andra Norton. So those are some interesting things that people can save. And of course, photographs. Photographs are really good for our primary resources. Oh, and these are also souvenir guides from the Expo, or the PNE, sorry, 1987. So these photographs, just to give you an idea of how important context is for things, I have photographs here that show the interior of someone's home. I've got that. I've got that. There's nothing written on the back of these. And I've got that one. But I just happen to know that put in context, all of those photographs are actually from the interior of this giant dollhouse that we have at Mackin House. So if someone had just found these random pictures, you might just think they're from somebody's home but it's far more interesting to know that it comes from this dollhouse. This dollhouse is huge. It's, uh, I don't know, it's maybe seven, seven feet tall, maybe, or maybe six. It's fairly tall. And we now have it on display when the museum reopens. You can see that in our children's bedroom. Of course, with dates or photographs of people, it's really helpful to have names on the back or associated with it. Dates are always good to have with uh, photographs of people. And then we also have scrapbooks. So now we're getting closer to the journal. This is an old scrapbook that was donated to us. This person included all kinds of things. There's photographs, there's clippings, there's ration books from the war. There's a application for leave during the war. So there's all a ticket from a Rotary Ice Carnival, the civil memorial service of His Late Majesty King George VI in 1952. So there's all kinds of things that you can add. Oh, and here is one of our, this is uh, Jenny who works here, who had the Frida Kahlo diary, also brought in her scrapbook, and she's got all kinds of different things in hers as well. So she's got photographs, she's got written material, she's got greeting cards, she's got cutouts from magazines. So the list is really endless as far as what you can include in a journal project. Oh, my little thing came off my mic. So what kinds of things might you include in a journal about the COVID pandemic? That depends on you, what strikes you as interesting. What kinds of things have you done during the pandemic? 
Did you read interesting articles or view interesting videos? Do you have mementos about this time that have meaning to you? Were you inspired to create art or to write? Were you sick? Is it your, it's your experience that will be of interest to future historians. And though you may not create your journal with the idea of specific, specific types of primary resources in mind, regardless of what you include, your journal will be a primary resource. What it tells the future will remain to be seen. If you would like to enhance your journal for, the fu for future researchers, some things to keep in mind are dates, names, places, events, descriptions of any of the above, personal interpretations like video, art, or music, statistics are always interesting, personal observations, and feelings. So that's the end of my presentation for the journal project. If you would like to participate in our journal project, please visit our website, coquitlamheritage.ca. And if there are any questions, I will attempt to answer them now. Thank you so much for that, Tanis. Um, Right now, we'll give people a couple minutes to come up with any more questions they have, but there was some request to see a little bit more about the Paris book. The Paris book? Yeah, the Delphine Hopper book about Paris, Ontario. What, what uh, specifically? Anything? Uh, someone just said they wanted to see it, so since they can't come in and see it right now, maybe you could just talk a little bit more about it. So on the back, it says Delphine Hopper, She's pictured here, it says, ready to leave the reactivation program at St. Joseph's Hospital in Brantford. And on her first day out from the hospital, she spent the day at home teaching her granddaughter how to pickle beets. She wrote for the Paris Star from 1982 to 1992 in the Seniors Report. And she talked a lot about life in the general area. I also happen to know that Delphine Hopper was a huge doll well she was a collector of dolls and she had a huge collection so um in the book it's mostly just little anecdotes that she's told but there are pictures included of different things and there's a class picture from the Dumfries school pictures of picking apples and she has included dates on all her entries so i'm not sure if that answers the question but that's what I can tell you about this book. Um, there was just a follow-up question of asking how old the book is. The book was published in 1999. Awesome. Printed by Thompson Printing and Lithographing Limited, Paris, Ontario. Um, we had one more question, uh, which was, can I include leaves or pressed flowers in my journal? You can. You can include anything you like. If you are considering donating your journal to our collection, which we are asking people to consider, we would prefer you don't have natural material just for collections purposes. We can't have things like, uh, well, we don't want any bugs. We don't want any mold. So macaroni necklaces, no thank you. And leaves and flowers dried. It's possible, but not ideal. Anything else? I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, if you have any more questions, you can comment them on the Facebook. Uh, the Facebook Live is going to stay up, so you can comment them there and we can uh, get back to you about them. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Tanis. And um, we will post some more information about a future Heritage Live coming up. Thanks, everyone. Bye.